Jory and his cousin were cutting up, tossing snowballs at passing cars. From Jory's street corner on Milwaukee's near south side, cars driving on 6th Street passed squat duplexes with porch steps ending at a sidewalk edged in dandelions. Those heading north approached the Basilica of St. Josephat, whose crowning dome looked to Jory like a giant overturned plunger. It was January of 2008, and the city was experiencing the snowiest winter on record. Every so often, a car turned off 6th Street to navigate Arthur Avenue, hemmed in by the snow, and that's when the boys would take aim. Jory packed a tight one and let it fly. The car jerked to a stop, and a man jumped out. The boys ran inside and locked the door to the apartment where Jory lived with his mother, Arlene, and younger brother, Jafaris. The lock was cheap, and the man broke down the door with a few hard-heeled kicks. He left before anything else happened. When the landlord found out about the door, she decided to evict Arlene and her boys. They had been there eight months. The day Arlene and her boys had to be out was cold. But if she waited any longer, the landlord would summon the sheriff, who would arrive with a gun, a team of boot-footed movers, and a folded judge's order saying that her house was no longer hers. She would be given two options, truck or curb. Truck would mean that her things would be loaded into an 18-footer and later checked into bonded storage. She could get everything back after paying $350. Arlene didn't have $350, so she would have opted for curb, which would mean watching the movers pile everything onto the sidewalk. Her mattresses, a floor model television, her copy of Don't Be Afraid to Discipline, her nice glass dining table, and the lace tablecloth that fit just so. Silk plants, Bibles, the meat cuts in the freezer, the shower curtain, Jafaris's asthma machine. Arlene took her sons, Jory was 13, Jafaris was five, to a homeless shelter, which everyone called the lodge, so you could tell your kids, we're staying at the lodge tonight, like it was a motel. The two-story stucco building could have passed for one, except for all the Salvation Army signs. Arlene stayed in the 120-bed shelter until April, when she found a house on 19th and Hampton, in the predominantly black inner city on Milwaukee's north side, not far from her childhood home. It had thick trim around the windows and doors, and was once Kendall Green, but the paint had faded and chipped so much over the years that the bare wood siding was now exposed, making the house look camouflaged. At one point, someone had started repainting the house plain white, but had given up mid-brushstroke, leaving more than half unfinished. There was often no water in the house, and Jory had to bucket out what was in the toilet. But Arlene loved that it was spacious and set apart from other houses. It was quiet, she remembered, and 525 for a whole house, two bedrooms upstairs and two bedrooms downstairs, it was my favorite place. After a few weeks, the city found Arlene's favorite place, unfit for human habitation, removed her, nailed green boards over the windows and doors, and issued a fine to her landlord. Arlene moved Jory and Jafaris into a drab apartment complex deeper in the inner city, on Atkinson Avenue, which she soon learned was a haven for drug dealers. She feared for her boys, especially Jory, slack-shouldered with pecan-brown skin and a beautiful smile, who would talk to anyone. Arlene endured four summer months on Atkinson, before moving into a bottom duplex unit on 13th Street in Keefe, a mile away. She and the boys walked their things over, Arlene held her breath and tried the lights, smiling with relief when they came on. She could live off someone else's electricity bill for a while. There was a fist-sized hole in a living room window. The front door had to be locked with an ugly wooden plank dropped into metal brackets, and the carpet was filthy and ground in. But the kitchen was spacious, and the living room well lit. Arlene stuffed a piece of clothing into the window hole and hung ivory curtains. The rent was $550 a month, utilities not included, the going rate in 2008 for a two-bedroom unit in one of the worst neighborhoods in America's fourth poorest city. Arlene couldn't find a cheaper place, at least not one fit for human habitation, and most landlords wouldn't rent her a smaller one on account of her boys. The rent would take 88% of Arlene's $628 a month welfare check. Maybe she could make it work. Maybe they could at least stay through winter until crocuses and tulips stabbed through the thawed ground of spring, Arlene's favorite season. There was a knock at the door. It was the landlord, Sharina Tarver. Sharina, a black woman with bobbed hair and fresh nails, was loaded down with groceries. 
she had spent $40 of her own money and picked up the rest at a food pantry. She knew Arlene needed it. Arlene thanked Sharina and closed the door. Things were off to a good start. 